You're very welcome to our Lenten series. As you know, Lent has changed quite dramatically in Ireland over the years. Years ago, the bishops used to decide on what our fast would be. Uh, famously, Bishop Con Lucy decided that one of our collations, coala uh, so we had, as you know, one meal and two collations, two snacks. He decided one of our collations would be a biscuit. So in their wisdom, the Cork people decided to bake the biscuit big. And so these, what became known as Connie Dodgers, named after Bishop Con, uh, became quite popular in Cork at the time. We have this impression of Lent as something to endure, something to get through. Uh, maybe it's because uh, we're called to give up things, things that we, we like. Part of this talk is to discern the ways God is calling us this Lent. And it seems a bit counterintuitive because ultimately what God is calling us to is happiness. So at Lent, he's calling us to be even happier. So it seems a bit counterintuitive to our understanding of Lent as something to endure and get through. What is happiness? Father Spitzer, an American author, has written on this uh, subject and he breaks it into four different levels. He says that ultimately happiness is a fulfillment of desire. So, I don't know if you remember, um, Onslow from the TV series Keeping Up Appearances. Um, Onslow um, would fit in possibly to level one, at least initially anyway, into fulfilling our biological needs. So once we fulfill our desires for the biological, food, drink, etc., we are happy. The question is for Father Spitzer, he asks about this idea is how deep is that um, happiness, what degree of happiness is it at? And he looks at pervasive, is it pervasive, does it affect a lot of people? No, because it only affects Onslow, he's only happy um, sitting down in front of the TV. Um, is it enduring? No, this kind of happiness is quite fleeting. And is it deep? Is it using much of his intellectual capacities? No, it's not. So we move on to the second level um, of happiness. And this is where in our teenage years we become more conscious, more self-conscious of ourselves as an I um, with others. We start to compare ourselves with others. And we enter into competition with others. So when we're winning, we're happy. When we're losing, um, we're sad. Onslow decided to study medicine and become a doctor. And in doing so, um, he, was, he won, he became top of his class, he was lauded and exalted by his fellow pupils. So we look at that, pervasive, yes, his family now was richer and happier because of his choice of pursuing this desire of happiness. Uh, enduring, yeah, he's, he's happier for a longer period of time, uh, being in a better position um, and people uh, applauding him, etc. And um, is it deep? Yeah, it's using more of his faculties. He had to study hard to become a doctor. Reading uh, the letter to the Galatians, it's interesting. I always call the letter to the Galatians the letter to the Irish because we know that the Galatians were the, the Celts of the time in that area. And in chapter 5, it says, Let us not become conceited, competing against one another, envying one another. In chapter 6, each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. Very interesting insights from St. Paul. So moving on to level three. Level three is making um, a contribution. So when we make a contribution, we become happy. When we fulfill that desire, we become happy. So we look at that. I mean, it's straightforward, working with the homeless, working with the Vincent de Paul. For Onslow, he decided that how he was going to make a contribution to society is that he was going to study hard and um, study embryology so he could help the pro-life movement, become an expert in embryology and help the pro-life movement. And so he did. And the idea of, is that, is that pervasive? Yeah, absolutely, because he's going to be saving unborn children's lives. Um, is it enduring? Yeah, helping somebody else is going to make him happier for a longer period of time. And is it deep? Yeah, he's, going to be, he's using more of the gifts of humanity of his, the gifts given to him of empathy and having a, a conscience. Two things to note about moving up the levels. We don't 
uh, dismiss the other levels. So obviously we still uh, have our biological desires and those biological desires need to be fulfilled for us to li live a complete and um, happy life. And we also need our Onslow moments. We need those times to relax. Moving on to level uh, two, also on level two, as long as we don't envy others or provoke others to envy, a certain amount of competition in sports and things like that, but also fulfilling um, projects and all that, we need to obviously have our place um, in society in those areas. The other thing to note is sacrifice. There's different sacrifices that take place. So when Onslow moved on to level two, uh, to study to be a doctor, of course he had to sacrifice. He couldn't be sitting down in front of the TV every night uh, or every day, whatever. He had to um, sacrifice some of that. And moving on to level three, um, people who are given more of a contribution to society have to give more of their time. And so by giving more of his time, uh, he couldn't focus on pursuing a greater career um, and more money and um, sacrifice and something like that to give back um, to society. Moving on to level four. Level four, of course, is where we um, have that desire for the transcendent, um, the desire for the, the spiritual. Um, it's, make, it's what makes us happiest. And this is this idea of the body and the soul. The body is satisfied. We know we can easily satisfy the body and keep it happy as such. But the soul, the soul needs to be satisfied, it needs to satisfy its desires. And its desire is for knowledge, to know. It's always seeking to know, it's always asking those why questions, it's looking for answers. And when answers lead to an awareness of something more than the material world, this is what we call transcendental awareness, awareness of the spirit, awareness of God. And so a person then starts to pursue. Once they become aware of something, they start to pursue it, trying to fulfill this desire for God. Obviously makes the person more pervasive because the person is becoming more charitable following the role, I will say, of Christianity. The person is definitely going to be affecting more people, enduring happiness, of course. If the person is going to be happier and depth. They're using their full faculties now, using the soul, um, all the faculties of the soul, and of course um, are more happier as a result. How one comes to be aware that there's more to life than just the material world is not the same for everybody. For some, um, like Onslow, he looking at the idea of abortion, um, reflects on it and says to himself, you know, where did this come from? Where did this understanding of that this is wrong come from? Indeed, where did the understanding of that slavery is wrong come from? So there must be some ideal of perfect justice to compare these other um, instances, instances of justice towards. C.S. Lewis, to get people in touch with transcendental ideas, to get people in touch with us, that's something more than this material world. He sets out similar arguments in mere Christianity. He talks about when people are arguing, he says, how, or quoting people, argument he says how would you like it if someone did the same to you or come on you promised and what Lewis notes from these um, engagements he said what interests me about all these remarks is that the man who makes them is not merely saying that the other man's behavior does not happen to please him he is appealing to some kind of standard or behavior which he expects the other man to know about so this standard Again, going back to the idea that it's this standard of justice, there's other standards that are being set in the, the moral order. And what Lewis talks about is that this is the natural law, this is the moral law that is written on everybody's heart and gives us an indication, again, that there's something more than this material world. Scientists unveil laws that govern the world. The poet Alexander Pope, uh, speaking about Newton, he said, nature and nature's laws lay, lay, hidden, lay hid in the night. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. Isaac Newton believed that these laws were from God, that God made these laws, that what was governing the universe was God. He says, this most beautiful system of the sun, planets and comets could only proceed 
from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent being. This being governs all things, not as the soul of the world, but as the Lord over all. So we have the moral order giving us an indication of something more. The scientific order giving us an indication of something more. Also nature gives us a sense of something more. We listen to St. Paul in um, his letter to the Romans. What may be known about God is plain to all people because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal and divine nature, have been clearly seen, been understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. So that men are without excuse. There's no excuse for us with nature not to see in behind it that there's something more than just the material. Whatever the reason for becoming aware that there's more than just the material, the person now being aware, being aware of, transcend, of trans, transcendent, being aware that there's something spiritual out there, being aware of that there is a supreme being, an intelligent being, what we call God, at least now they know there's a reason to the world. Something governs the world, something's behind it, and there's a truth, there's a purpose to their lives. The opposite is quite shocking. No truth, no order to the world means no purpose in one's life. What the atheist, atheistic philosophers talk about, that life is observed. You may have heard of the famous French philosopher Jacques Maritain and his wife Raisa. Both were brought up, brought up in you know, religious homes, but by the time they got to college, both were atheists. They said that if they didn't find the meaning to life, if they didn't find the answers to the meaning for life, they made this pact that they would commit suicide within a year. This is what it meant to them, seeking out truth, that they felt that life was meaningless, but if they'd found a reason um, for life, that life, an answer to the meaning for life, that they uh, wouldn't uh, kill themselves. And thank God they met some cat Catholic intellectuals who convinced them of the true meaning of life. Another atheist looking for an answer was Edith Stein. Laura Garcia, a Catholic journalist, wrote that Stein's philosophical studies encouraged her openness to the possibility of transcendent realities. So Edith Stein, her, she was an atheist, studying philosophy, but these studies were opening it up to the possibility of tran transcendent realities. Edith Stein herself said, all those who seek truth, seek God, whether this is clear to them or not. And famously her conversion, when she was in a friend's house, she read the book of St. Teresa of Avila, and when she closed it, read it in one night, she closed it and said, this is truth. Jesus famously before Pilate um, said, I come to bear witness to the truth. And Pilate turns back and asks the question, what is truth? So how can our souls see this truth, this reality, this reality, God's answers to the world? Well, it's summed up in one line from our Lord. Happy are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Happy are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. At the Greek games, Pythagoras tells us, this is going back 2,000 years ago or over 2,000 years ago, uh, it wasn't the ticket sellers outside, it wasn't the trainers, it wasn't the athletes who were the most lauded, uh, the people exalted, it was those who watched. Those who watched the games were seen as the greatest um, at the time of these, uh, these great Greek Olympics. Watching is a missing discipline, dare I say, from modern Catholic spirituality. Another word for it is contemplation. Contemplation simply is observing something, silently observing something. And coming to know it, coming to notice something, not through our intellect. Contemplation's not, nothing to do with our intellect, but purely through uh, simple intuition. And finally, contemplation. Contemplation is amazement, as um, it, this gift to us, it becomes a reality which invokes amazement, 
because it exceeds our comprehension even though we see it and have a direct intuition of it. That's from Joseph Pieper and his book Happiness and Contemplation. Contemplation, as St. Teresa will tell us, is pure gift. It's pure grace and um, it's also a celebration and it is joyful. Dare I say you've experienced contemplation already. Think of a beautiful sunset that you've experienced silently observing something and you have that simple intuition that there's something more. You have the simple intuition and then this amazement. Amazement. There's a knowledge there. There's a knowledge there but you can't really put your finger on it but you sit there in celebration and in joy at what you're seeing. Peter Creeve talks about himself and his wife bringing their child to hospital with a brain tumour and thank God a successful operation all clear bringing the, the child home and just sitting gazing at their child with these smiles on their face for a full week just sitting there gazing upon their child silently observing their child coming to know by simple intuition the amazement and the wonderment of God's gift to them and mass Joseph Pieper tells us that Mass is the greatest moment of contemplation, this greatest moment of celebration. We call it the celebration of the Mass. He said it is a joyful occasion. And this is why it's so important when we talk about how do we see. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Happy are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This sin affects us seeing. Sin affects us seeing the sunset all the time. Sin affects us seeing the true beauty of the Mass. We go back to Scripture, St. Paul, Corinthians 2, chapter 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the Gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. John 1, um, chapter 2. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. St. Teresa and her seven mansions, the first three mansions is all about this detachment from sin. And the last four mansions is all about us growing in contemplation, growing in that depth of prayer with God. So Lent, it's the perfect time for us to detach, to go deeper in our relationship with God, to detach from sin and so go deeper and deeper in our prayer life. And a good place to start, a good place to start this Lent is to look at what the spiritual writers call the predominant fault. Our Dominican priest, um, gone to his happy reward, Father uh, Gary Gould Lagrange says about the predominant fault. He says the predominant fault is the defect in us that tends to prevail over the others and thereby over our manner of feeling, judging, sympathizing, willing and acting. It is a defect that has in each of us an intimate relation to our individual temperament. So it's a defect that has in each of us an intimate relation to our individual temperament. And so our temperament, temperaments are inclined to these predominant faults. So these are some of the predominant faults and they might ring true for you. Timidity, laziness, sloth, gluttony, sensuality, anger, pride. Father Gary Gill goes on. We do not all climb the same slope towards the summit of perfection. Those who are too timid by temper, temperament must by prayer, grace and virtue become strong. And those who are naturally strong, to the point of easily becoming severe, must, by working at themselves and by grace, become gentle. He goes on and talks about that our predominant fault can lie hidden next to a virtue. So next to the virtue of gentleness, if timidity lies there next um, to our, our virtue of gentleness, it can turn into weakness and overindulgence and the inability to speak up for the truth while fortitude again a good virtue in itself to develop however if it's linked with the predominant fault of anger it can lead to irrational violence how do we find it we find it by asking god we pray 
for the Lord to help us find it. Also, Gary Gu tells us that it's what thought most occupies our mind. Is it thoughts of pride, anger? What thoughts most occupy our mind? That's where our predominant fault more than likely lies. He also says we can ask another. We can ask a friend. We can ask um, the husband or the wife um, or indeed our spiritual director. Um, some people might want to point out our faults to us, but uh, they might help us to uh, give us um, more insight into our predominant fault. Again, happy are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Happy are the pure in heart, they shall see God. In John 8, chapter 12, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus was talking in John chapter 12, he was talking to the Jewish people at a time of a great festival, the Feast of Tabernacles. And this was celebrating the time for the Jewish people when um, they were going through the desert for those 40 years. And tabernacles translates to tents. So some Jewish people even today will set up tents in their, in their back gardens to remember this great feast. But here's Jesus speaking into this moment. I am the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. What happened to the Jewish people back in that desert for those 40 years? They were led by the light of God. For 40 years they roamed in that desert because of their doubt. They didn't get to the promised land because of their doubt, because of their sinfulness and because um, of their lack of faith. But Jesus shines that light for us today. We enter into our 40 days in the desert. Jesus helps us in our doubt. Jesus helps us in our sinfulness. Jesus helps us in our lack of faith. He helps us see God. And so in seeing, we fulfill our desire, our soul's desire. We, in seeing God, we fulfill our soul's desire and so are happy. However, not fully fulfilled in this earth, as St. Paul tells us, I only see dimly now what is to be revealed. I only see dimly now in the mirror what is to be revealed our pure happiness with the beatific vision. Amen.